Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. In a piece in the London Review of Books, Seymour Hersh debunks the American narrative of the capturing of Osama bin Laden. He says the official version is more like a fairy tale than fact. Now joining us from his office is Seymour Hersh. Thanks very much for joining us. Sure. So the basic thesis, thesis, if I understand correctly, is the two top military leaders of Pakistan, the chief of the army and the chief of the ISI, in fact, not only knew where bin Laden was and not only cooperated with the Americans, um, but the entire official version that this was done as a completely unilateral American mission is, is a lie. Um, that's pretty good accurate description of yes exactly right I, I I think the way I usually say it is the president authorized the raid in the seal team the American seal team seal team six which is our most uh, uh, th these are good people this is the sort of the cream cream of crop of this because the special forces they did go into uh, Abbottabad this little resort town outside of Islamabad the capital of Pakistan where bin Laden was a prisoner or under the control of the Pakistanis for years since 2006 and they killed him Period. Came back. Successful mission. After that, most of the other story just isn't right. Now, the 10,000 word article, it's extremely detailed. We're not going to try to go through the whole, uh, all Thank the God. details. Yeah. Because people should go read the article. Uh, not only is it very detailed, but it's also a great read. So, go read it. That being said, a few questions. Why, why wouldn't the Americans want to capture bin Laden and interrogate him? We would. We, we would have wanted to very much. Uh, just you're getting ahead of the curve here. Let me just let me just do the chronology for you. What happens is in 2010, a guy that worked, a, a, a retired military officer who was involved in in something to do with the 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 building in which uh, uh, Bin Laden was a prisoner, or what you will, some in a Badabad, some guy that he had something to do with the security, maybe provided guards for the for the complex, but he was a he was a retired officer on contract with the Pakistani intelligence service, the ISI, that's what it is. It's the counterpart to our CIA, the Pakistani counterpart. This guy walks into the American embassy in, in Islamabad and wants to, you know, there's a bounty. We put, we put about 25 million buck reward for the guy's head. And so this guy comes in and he, he wants the money and he tells us where bin Laden is and tells us a lot of other information. He says bin Laden was picked up by the Pakistanis somewhere in the rural district on the near the border with Afghanistan, a place called Waziristan. Um, and, um, uh, in a mountain area, and uh, they had him as a prisoner basically since '06. Um, he also says we later learned that the Pakistanis uh, had told the Saudis about it, and the Saudis' position with the Pakistanis was we'll build a house for him, we'll build the complex where he was staying, we'll pay for that, we'll give you some money. We don't know how much. I think a lot. Uh, I've heard a lot, but I don't know. I just don't know what the answer is. We will pay you not to tell the Americans why because they, the last thing they want is to have the Americans go interrogate Osama bin Laden about who was giving him money back in 01 when he took down New York and Washington. So that's the reasonable assumption. Because according to the Senate uh, co-investigation into 9-11, Congressional Committee, Bob Graham and such, many, according to Graham, Saudi government officials are in on financing and facilitating the 9-11 attacks. Well, we, 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 you know, we don't have the money transfer, we don't have the empirical evidence, but getting Bin Laden to say something would have been important. And so that was a, a pretty good reason. The other reason, you know, the, the, the Pakistanis have their own axe to grind in the world. They don't have to tell us everything. But in any case, once... What One more question. Why not kill him? Then? What do you mean? Why not kill, why not him? kill Bin Laden? If Where? If you're afraid of... Well, once they have him, why not kill him? Why keep him for six years? Well, first of all, they're being paid to keep him. Second of all, they, as long as they have bin Laden, the Pakistani intelligence service can go to the Taliban in Afghanistan and the Taliban in Pakistan and say, and also to the jihadists, the Sunni, the Sunni wackos in both countries, and say, we got your guy. And you have to understand, at this point, bin Laden was 10 times more than, what, a huge number more, more popular than we were, than America. As America, at one point, was only, polls show only 8% of the people in Pakistan liked us. They didn't like us. They saw us as guys that dropped bombs on them, uh, which we just may be. And, um, and so um, the, the issue was just to go kill him. Um, if, the Pac if, if Pasha and Kiani, the, the two generals who ran the country then, the army general was named Kiana, the head of the intelligence service was named Pasha. If they had just gone and whacked the guy, if anything had come out, leaked out, I'm, I'm just giving you a reason for that. Uh, this this never came up in my interviews, 
because I was always looking at it from the American point of view. But it would make sense to me that the last thing they'd want to have happen is have to, the, let the population know that they were involved in killing bin Laden. How would you keep that a secret? So I, I, that makes sense, but your question is good and unanswered. Okay. Uh, we're going to go through a lot of, uh, much of the specifics of the story. But this all really comes down to confidence in you, that you have sources, because your, your sources you can't reveal. Uh, or don't I could, but they'd be in jail the next day with and, you know, and, and a pretty the, tough government here. And the key, the, I understand that, and the key source is a retired former American intelligence official who seems to know very much about the inside of all this. And there's a great detail of, of the mission, of the background to this. So this is somebody who, two things. One, you've placed your career in his hands, and he's placed his life to a large extent in your hands. Go ahead. I, I, I just don't talk about sources. You're free to talk about all you want. All I can tell you is that the sources that I describe are, are primary sources. And of course, as I also said in the article, I'm capable of taking some of the most inside stuff I learn and finding others who know about it. That was my follow-up question, which is how do, you, how do you know, given how much you have at stake in terms of your own credibility here, how do you verify what he says? Well, I've always, you know, I'm dealing with a core group of people that I've known for a long time, and I've written a lot of stories in the last, particularly since 9-11, a lot of tough stories about, uh, you know, some of the, the junk we do in, we, we did in Afghanistan and, in, and, and in also in uh, Iraq during the war there. Torture, killings, murder, I mean, a lot of very bad stuff that, you know, I, one could argue that America had to get that bloody in the war and terror. That makes sense to me. But there was an awful lot of, of, of not so much smart stuff. There was stuff done inside, assassinations done, stuff with, done with the Israelis inside, uh, inside Iran. There was a lot of stuff I wrote about over the last 10, 10, 12 years that have, you know, gotten a lot of people's attention and some, a lot of criticism, et cetera. So it's not as if I'm dealing with somebody tabula risa. This is somebody that, this is somebody I've worked with a long time. And have been able to verify well, over the course and of time. It's even more, just to give you more detail, the raid took place uh, in, in U.S. time on, on the late in the night of May 2nd, four years ago, 2011. Within two or three days, I heard from people here and people in Pakistan that there were problems that the whole story that the White House was being told is, was really off. And the critical thing about the whole idea of working with the Pakistanis and doing it, the White House does, want, does, does not want to acknowledge. And right now, there's been a couple of stories written in the last, few, last, last two days, both by NBC and now by uh, uh, the Don, oh, I, I just see a, um, um, AFP, the, uh, the French press agency, a story out of Pakistan saying two more people have claimed that there was a walk-in that this, you know, basically backing up what I wrote. And the White House's position now is, well, there may have been a walk-in, um, but he uh, had nothing to do with uh, getting bin Laden. The walk-in happens in 2010? Yeah, the walk-in, August of 2010. So for like two years, uh, the United States government has a fair idea where bin Laden is alleged to be. And so what happens? Well. Well, 2010, it's, it's, it's in August of 2010. The raid takes place nine months later in May. So it's a year, a year and three months. So what happens is once you get the walk-in, the first thing you do, walk-ins, you know, being sometimes shady characters, you know, some guy says, hey, where's my money? They flew in a team from Washington to polygraph him. He passes the test. He's also known. He's, people know he's not a guy that isn't known in Pakistan. He's got some, he's got some flair. And so um, we start working it without telling the Pakistanis. And we get to the point after some weeks, uh, we, you know, we set up a safe house near the, uh, bin, bin Laden's living uh, in a compound, as I, as I said, in a resort city, but he's sort of at the low end of it. It's sort of a shaggy place and it's got high walls and um, no sign of any uh, internet connections. I mean, there's no, no, no evidence of any power even really significantly. And, um, we can't get a fix on it. So, uh, and meanwhile, the, we're telling the president, they're briefing the president as they have to, and the president's saying, absolutely correctly, you know, I'm not gonna touch this. I don't, you, you don't guys have, you know, bring me, you know. And how do you know that? That the president said that? This comes uh, well, I, well, I, that, I'm, I'm not saying I, you tell me the source, but. I, no, I'm not, how do I know what he said literally? No, I don't know. I was, I was using a, uh, what the president said is, I need more evidence. That's what he said. You know, he, the president made it clear that that wasn't good enough. So at that point, they go to the Pakistanis. They go to see the two ranking generals, General Kiani, 
head of the army and General Pasha, head of the intelligence service, the ISI, the counterpart to, as I said, the counterpart to the uh, CIA. And we say to those guys, you know, you know, whatever you say, you rats, why didn't you tell us this, you know, what's, what's going on? And eventually they squeeze them, as I mentioned, money talks. Now, just uh, you point out in the article that they start slowing down the flow of money to the military because there's a yeah, there's, enormous... Yeah, there's account. a big, always a flow, and there's always on the table and under the table stuff, too. So, you know, we, we take care of the boys. And so that, all that is, um, is uh, cut back, and so they begin to cooperate. We set up a four-man team at a very secret base called, not so secret, but there's secret activities there called uh, Gaza, Tarbella Gaza, about 15 minutes flying time from Abbottabad. That's the main headquarters for us, and we're there. And we're beginning to, you know, we're going to send a bunch of SEALs in there to kill this guy. We want to know how many steps are there to his room. Uh, there's steel doors. How, how strong is the steel door? How much dynamite do we have to use to blow it? You know, we're not going to get a key. And so we, know all the, we have to get all this information. What's the square like? What, what kind of security? It was arranged that with the, the Pakistanis were guarding it. They had guards there at night. I don't know many, whether it was four, six, eight. I've heard numbers um, as many as eight to 12, but they probably rotate. And the, so the guards were instructed uh, eventually to, uh, as soon as they hear the rotors of our choppers coming, get out. The, mari the, the seals were going to land with no opposition. There was no firefight there. There was no reason to fight your way in. Is there any? Do we have any idea how many guards there were? No, many? no. I just we have a number, but I, it's not. A, it's not. A, you know, it's there. Was because one, one thing uh, that, that I wonder about is if, if they've been holding him since uh, 2006. There's pretty good evidence that there are sections of the ISI and the Army, and, and including the Navy, that have been infiltrated, have a lot of Al-Qaeda supporters, uh, mm -hmm. Taliban you supporters. You bet. Yet there doesn't seem to have been an attempt by any of them to free bin Laden over these years. I, I don't think, I, I think that it, was, it was pretty kept pretty slow, pretty kept pretty quiet, of course. I mean, what, oh, I, my God, they're not going to pass it around. One of the big worries we have about Pakistan, don't forget that's sort of the elephant in the room with Pakistan at all times, is their nuclear arsenal. They're between, you know, when I did a story about it about four or five years ago, it was 100, more than 100 weapons then, you know, and they've been producing it still. They have, they're, they're still producing enriched uranium. And I think they even started a, 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 a plutonium a, a reprocessing facility. So they have an ability to make more bombs, and they are making more bombs. And so we have to try and keep our relationships with the top of that army very tight. Because, you know, that's the only leverage we have is we have arms. We, we want them to trust us. So, if I understand it correctly, President Obama makes a deal with with uh, well, the president. The pe president's not involved in this. I mean, he's getting briefings on it. What happens is, the president says, "I need more." So we go to the Pakistan's. What are the, one of the first things they do is they assign a doctor, uh, um, an army major that's also a doctor, uh, a specialist, in, a nephrologist. Actually, I, I understand. Uh, uh, they assign him to to uh, live in a house next door to. Uh, close by the house at Abbottabad, where bin, but bin Laden leaves. He's treating him. He also gets DNA for us. This is before the end of the year. So now we can tell the president, the guys who want to do the mission, uh, we've got DNA on the guy. And the PACs How are, does he get the DNA? He just, he's a doctor. He's treating him. Hmm. He's, not, um, he's, he's ill. I mean, they snuffed out, you know, they killed the guy that was pretty sick. You know, they're, they're, you know this, this isn't the best day in the sun for the SEALs. They had a mission to do, and they did it. And the idea that, you know, it was, as I said, it was never to be made public, they did it. The whole idea was you go kill the guy, you come out with the body. This Pakistani said, kill him and take the body. You come out and you don't tell anybody. The plan was that in seven to ten days, they were, the White House was, the president was going to announce that we had a drone raid in, in, the, in the Hindu Kush mountains. In the mountains, it's the same mountain range I, where we picked up um, uh, uh, Bin Laden in the first place. And uh, we, we did an after act, you know, we go and look at it after the, after the attack. And sure enough, there's a tall guy that looks like Bin Laden. We take his picture, we take some DNA, we got him. That was the plan. The night of the raid, everything worked. A chopper went down, but so what? Who cared? Um, the electricity was cut four hours before the raid. A chopper went down and they had to blow it because the cockpit had some very sensitive aviation and... Uh, communications gear. You can imagine we're speaking really encrypted stuff on this mission. And so they have to blow it. There's a big fire going on, a lot of noise, no police, no fire department, uh, no lights anywhere. I mean, did we do all that? The Pakistanis clearly did. I'm just telling you what's, what's literally factually there. And that was all in all the reports. I don't know how that, 
I don't know how anybody could walk away from this and not think Pakistan had something to do with it, but that's neither here nor there. That's easy to say afterwards. And so they fly out. When they fly out, <coughs> uh, they have to take a body. Um, I don't know what use the body is to them because there's gonna be, they're going to find another guy in another week. You know, but I don't. I, I just don't know. And when and then everybody discovers the game plan is completely changed. Obama went public, and why does he go public? He went public because I'm sure that he got tremendous pressure after they realized they'd killed him to go to not wait ten days or seven days. You 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 know you, you've got a Republican guy Bob Gates in in the uh, running the Defense Department. He's involved. You've got a lot of guys that like to brag, and the military are always full of guys that yap. You can't be sure you, in a week or 10 days you can hold the secret. So go. So he goes, and the president gets a speech to deliver. He, you know, sometimes he writes his speeches. Uh, he's quite good at that. But um, in this case, he gets a speech delivered. I have no idea what's in his head. And those when, when people say, uh, the government did lie, I, I don't know whether he knew that what he was writing wasn't accurate or not. I just don't know. Because often a president is confronted, you know, he's dealt with what he gets. I have no information about that. But he, in the statement, he makes a lot of things, he says a lot of things that drives everybody nuts. Meanwhile, you've got a bureaucracy. You've got a problem. You, you now have a body, you have some seals that know a lot. The whole game plan's destroyed. And you've betrayed, essentially, the Pakistani you certainly leaders. Double, you certainly, uh, the, you, you could, you know, you've certainly uh, taken advantage of them. And what, what are their options? Uh, if uh, Pasha and Kiani say, the hell with you, America, we're going to tell the truth, you double cross this. A, there goes the money. B, <laughs> um, all kinds of people in Pakistan are going to come after them. All the people like bin Laden, they're going to have to... You this know. was the whole point, to protect them from this kind of revenge that would... Exactly. Come. And that's why you, that was why you, you, as you say to me, why couldn't they just go whack them? Because if they whacked them, if, if the, the Pakistanis whacked them di directly themselves and it leaked out, boy, they're in trouble. So this was a sort of a way to cover the whole thing and make it easy. And uh, instead, uh, what the president said, and this was a speech that was just written by the political guys, as I've been told, uh, emphatically. And he said, for example, we got a lead in August last year. Well, in the CIA, a lead is often a walk-in. It's not couriers running around giving you something you deduce. It's uh, something handed to you. So everybody got edgy about that. And then he said there was a firefight and bin Laden was killed as if bin Laden had an AK-47 was, you know, shooting away. Uh, that wasn't so. And so now you, had to, now you had to invent a firefight. He said we got a treasure trove of information. Now you had to invent a treasure trove of information that nobody's seen yet. <laughs> you know, oh, we've never had more information about Al-Qaeda and what it was doing. We haven't seen a thing about it. I mean, maybe a little bit, but not much. And so all these things, you suddenly had, you had to be in a rush and put out a whole new package of what's going on. So that led in the first couple of days to incredible stories. First of all, the political guys in the White House and John Brennan, his, his head of counterinsurgency and counterterror and others, all of a sudden they're presented with a, a, a press corps that's begging, feed me, feed me, feed me, like in that movie. Feed me, feed me. And so they feed him. The first round is the guys entered and there was, a, there was people came out with guns and they shot a bunch of people. There was a firefight. Then they went in there and bin Laden had a gun and was cowering behind two women and they shot him. And then eventually they had to walk away from that very quickly within a few days. That was embarrassing. Uh, there were other stuff that, that they said that kept on going. You, you had a, now you had to invent a treasure, you had to invent a treasure trove. So they started, this is a place that always had been described as a primitive place with no internet. So now they're briefing that the SEALs, when they went in to kill the guy, after they shot him, took 15 bags or 15 computers out. And um, in, in a book written by, a, a, a book that was read in advance by the government called No Easy Day by a guy named Bissonette, one of the SEALs who was um, on the mission, he describes, he goes down, he describes, it says, we went down to the second floor and there was a beautiful, he had an office with computers and, and discs and uh, uh, sticks, you know, what do they call those sticks? Um, USB sticks. Yeah, USB sticks. And we got all of that stuff, as if Bin Laden was sort of keeping it there for them, wait, waiting for them to take it. It was just a ludicrous story, but it matched what the president said, treasure trove. The, the, the narrative that came out, perhaps the, the central narrative, was the courage of Obama, that he made this call. He said well, in he, that he war did. room. He did. But, 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 but what, to say, what you're disputing is that it wasn't so courageous in the sense that they had the cooperation of the Pakistanis. They knew it was bin Laden. I mean, what's the great courage here? Well, the, 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 the one always 
the, the one risk, the thing that kept it at 50%, and when they talked about, Obama talked about only 50% sure, because if you didn't know it was bin Laden there, if that was the, the way we were described us, we weren't 100% sure. Remember they had to say Geronimo, which meant they got him. If you, and of course they knew it was bin Laden. That, that was false. Um, and they the weren't other, gonna get any resistance because it was Pakistani guards that simply left. And, and, and the other side of it is also that the only risk, once you know it's bin Laden, you, you then have the situation where the only risk you have is will a chopper go down? And if you want to know what I've been told, and I didn't write this in the article because it seemed like so much in, inside baseball, the, you know, it was such an easy mission. If you think about it, the SEALs are flying in the killer guy in a, foreign, a country with which we're not at war. And there, there's a, a, a mile away from the Abbottabad about is, west, is their west point. You know, that's where they train their military. And two miles away is the division headquarters. They're coming in, happy as clams, no air cover, you know, talking about rappelling down, you know, rappelling into a courtyard where anybody with a, sh a BB gun could, could, you know, could hit them. And why? Because they know it's safe. My belief, and I, 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 I didn't write this because that even the second chopper was redundancy. You just need one. Two groups. Seals, the seals are in squads of six because that's how many fit into a dinghy which is funny because none of the SEALs have been in water in so long. They've been just underground slogging it out since 9-11. SEALs are trained to do underwater stuff, and so that's why they have squads of six. Anyway, so one squad went in to kill them. The other squad did cover. And the other two squads, I guess, were going to work outside. The chopper goes down, um, and then there's a, a problem. You've got to call up. You have a backup chopper, maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes flying away. The flying time away, and the backup chopper was—it's a Chinook. It's a big hopper, a big uh, uh, chopper. It was filled with what they call bl a bladder of, of gas, of uh, petrol, fuel. The the planes are going to refuel from from the, uh, the 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 larger choppers that were left about. They were about 20 minutes flying time away, discreetly far enough away, and they had a take out the bladder and put it, you know, reconfigure it so they can get troops and people into it. So instead of a mission that the time is going to be 20 minutes, it's now 40 minutes. So a, the only tension was that. But the guys are just hanging around. They're not worrying about it. I mean, the more you think about it, the more you realize it's almost ineluctable that we're not told the whole story. You've, you've exploded two very big bombs here. One bomb in Pakistani politics. Because for everything that they were afraid of, the chief of the, the army and chief of ISI, well, it's now out. And if this is believed in Pakistan, everything they were afraid of is, is now they're on, on the dirt target for. The Al-Qaeda, the Taliban forces, popular opinion that hates this kind of cooperation with the Americans is all going to turn on them. So that's one bomb. And by the way, just to interrupt and say that, the, um, uh, I think the Pakistani government announced today they were going to look begin a formal investigation into this. They were going to issue a statement later this week. Yeah. And then the other bomb is one of the central legacies of President Obama. He got bin Laden. Well, that's Maybe tough because I'm a, I, you know, I support I'm, you know, as a, uh, just as a, a human being. I voted for him twice, and I think he's the smartest president we've had probably since uh, Lincoln. You know, he's a pretty amazing guy. And I do end up by the piece by saying, look, the Obama of 2011, a year before re-election, you know, some black dude wants to be reelected twice in America. You got to be kidding me! I mean, you know, I can understand reaching out and and doing what you can. And the president we have now, who is hanging tough in Iran, is a different person. And telling the Republicans to go stick it where the sun don't shine, this is a different person. So you have to say that. But there's no question. Then, um, uh, I I hope we can get a. I, we won't get a statement from him. We won't get a real statement from the White House because it's an embarrassment. It wasn't the best day in the sun. But the more this story has traction, and uh, mainstream media, everybody's talking about well, it. Well, but they're not. The there's, there's mainstream only, most of their, there's an awful lot of bitching at me, basically. Well, in the this media. is where I was heading. There's only one way to critique this, which is to attack the messenger. Well, the White House started that. They, they began to talk about it, you know, saying things like, there's so many inaccuracies in this story, we don't know where to begin, and I can't stand reading it. <laughs> Meanwhile, nobody's, you know, and so the press writes, the White House attacks the debunks, debunked story, but they don't say a word about anything official. I just got a call today saying that the CA may end up saying today that we don't think there was a walk-in. But that's permissible in the CIA to protect the walk-in. And you know, here's the thing that I mentioned, I probably should have done more about it. In terms of, of state of mind, 
The head of the Joint Special Operations Command, which ran this mission, is an admiral named McRaven. He's now ch uh, chancellor of the University of Texas. And a, a bright guy, smart guy, admiral, you know, three, four-star admiral, ambitious like all of them. And so in 2013, about two years after the event, there was a lot of questions raised, particularly about all aspects, the constant freedom of information questions. They, the White House kept on talking about they buried him on, uh, he was buried at sea. Bin Laden, there's just a lot of, I just write about this a lot. I, I don't definitively say, I can just tell you many people I know that really know the issue don't believe it happened. Well, you, you quote two sources that tell you the funeral never happened on the ship. Well, I, I have one guy that said to me, a wonderful line, you, 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 mean, you know, mean he's not in the water? He said, <laughs> laughing when I asked him about it. I went back and I go back to these people all the time. And so um, I also quote a Pakistani former ISI general, a very competent guy named Asad Durrani on the record saying that when this happened, as a former head of the ISI, he served in the 90s there, he said, I began to ask questions and I got the same answers you did, Mr. Hirsch. And he said that on the record, a lot of back and forth on that. And, and uh, um, he said that uh, my understanding was there was a walk-in and the Americans were, you know, we were involved and the Americans uh, didn't, you know, double, the word he used was double-crossed. And we, we sort of changed it. I, I went to him and said, let's just say that they just had a change of mind because double cross suggests from the moment it started, Obama wasn't going to play, wasn't, was going was gonna to cut off the two generals. I don't think so. I think it was done. He was pushed that into the last minute, but I don't know. In any case, uh, we're left with this. Um, just go back to Obama going public on this. By going public, when he announces this, not in the agreed upon way, I mean, it's quite opportunistic because of the elections, one would think, because now he emerges as the guy that got. Well, he was going to get, he was going to be able to say it, but it's but, much he, but, he, but he also oh, he opens the door for the possible revela revelation that you do get to eventually, of the role of the Pakistani generals. Uh, and this oh, is, absolutely. And this is a real threat to uh, you would think to well, American, it, 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 the way it, they perceive it, American national security. Yes, and I'm sure there was you know it's clear there was a big fight that night. Gates in his memoir writes very bitterly about that night, but he doesn't say that what the issue is. So he's really against it, and. Um, uh, I know there was a lot of animosity um, in that White House towards Bob Gates, and I think that probably helped think that if they if they ought to go public now because Gates, who was a Republican, Gates, I've got no problem with Gates. I don't think he would have done it, but they were, you know, Gates had been very much against what they did, going public, and also against uh, the uh, Gates. Ostensibly said he was protecting the seals, but it's pretty clear to me uh, uh, that. His real motive is he, he's also protecting the generals. Are you convinced that bin Laden was uh, under arrest or was he being protected? Oh, no, he was a prisoner uh, in the control of. He wasn't a prisoner in the sense that he's, there's a lockdown, you know, and he, he gets a shower every other day or something I mean, like there that. Was a, if I remember the story, it sounded like couriers are coming back and forth. No, and that's all, but that was just lying. That's all bull. Well, of course. The, 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 yeah, look. If you have a walk-in and you don't want to say you have a walk-in, which is legitimate, you got to invent a story. So here comes the wise guys at the CIA saying, well, let's just say we, we did all this brilliant work and we found couriers. And then the other thing the CIA wanted to say, and this is what was set off Gates, they wanted the president to announce he was, we found the couriers because of enhanced interrogation, because of torture. And if you ever saw that movie Zero Dark Thirty, it begins with torture. You know, which is the way the CIA guys wanted it. And uh, Gates said, you can't do that. That isn't what happened. And it's in the torture report, too, that way. I, I actually get into that in the piece a little bit. Well, obviously, the movie is also a complete fabrication. Uh, yeah, but if anybody that goes to a movie and thinks he's seen the real thing. You but know, it's, a, it's a fabrication based on a fabri of a fabrication. It's a fabrication of a fabrication. But, you know, if you go to a movie suspecting, you know, this is going to be the real McCoy, you're in trouble. You know, you know it's... And so when I like it, when they, they say it's based on a true life story. There's a Navy SEAL that disputes that your, your account that says there was no firefight. He says there was. When he said that the body was real full of holes and we were throwing it out the helicopter, that an ISI guy helped us up the stairs. That if we had any help from most diff other countries, we put them in the back and we just bring them along to say they're along. We do the work. There was no ISI in there. There was... Uh, there was three men. We killed two of them down, uh, one in the guest house. We killed one on the first floor, and then we killed uh, Khalid bin Laden, the son on the stairs. And then I, we went up into the room. I saw Osama bin Laden standing on two feet. There were no ISI up there. I shot him in the head twice, and then I shot him again in the face uh, when he was on the ground. Uh, also, the Bissonette book. This is O'Neill, who hasn't written the book, but he's the, one of the two shooters. And also uh, Bissonette, who wrote a book called No Easy Day, I think. 
Mark Bissonnet, in his book, he's got a dramatic account of shooting away. Uh, the, the only thing I can tell you is from the very first moment I heard about this story, from the Americans, from somebody who had access to what the SEALs had reported, the only bullet fired was into the leg of a woman. And I, I, all I can tell you, the other side of the story is there's just no question that if the Pakistanis, I've been told this repeatedly, the Pakistanis told everybody, all the guards, to get out. They wanted the, the, the SEALs to land without any weapons there. Uh, there were people living uh, uh, in, the, in the compound, had a, a big house, and it had a little house where they, there were people, I, you could, caretakers, I don't know what they were. There were people, and, uh, but the notion that the SEALs landed with bullets flying, uh, the only thing I can say, I have no reason to believe that's true. And Bissonnette also, not This is again all based on your primary source. But from the very beginning, before long before the books came out, O'Neill also said that we went in there terrified, thinking this is it, we're going to die. Well, maybe he did, but uh, that wasn't what the impression I had, the, what the attitude towards the mission was. Now, a big part of the official narrative is that bin Laden was still in control. He was still yeah. the mastermind. Right. But you write that bin Laden was delusional, had limited contact with the outside world, with the outside world outside his compound. Well, that, that, I'm quoting somebody named um, uh, uh, Patrick Coburn, I think, in that case. He, he was describing that we, we finally released about three years later some, some alleged documents that we took from... Uh, from bin Laden's uh, uh, house. I, I'm not saying documents weren't fine. They weren't taken by the SEALs. The next day, ISI came into the house and probably cleaned it out, I'm sure. The ISI also took away, he had, he had a couple of wives and a bunch of children. And we were told we would get to see it. We never saw them again. They were, the, a year later, they were flown to Saudi Arabia. We never interviewed any of them. And all these sort of lacuna, these things that, don't, that end up not being covered are sort of fascinating to me because so many things were said that didn't happen. And if you go and I read the accounts, I read the accounts of the various memoirs, there's huge discrepancy between who did what, which is the byproduct of having an operational plan that at the last minute has changed. Once the president says, we're going to go tonight, we're going to go public, they have to change it. They have to, have, they have to explain why they got to identify him so quick. So they have to have DNA, the fastest turnaround on DNA I've ever seen. You know, to do DNA right, it takes quite a while. You can, take, you, can, you can do a test and you have to take it really carefully looked at in a lab. And they don't have that kind of equipment out there. You have to fly it to Frankfurt and get it analyzed. Uh, you know, that's just, we're talking about days. But they had instant. They had to invent instant. They had to get rid of a body instantly. They had to get a body instant, instantly. It all changed. The, the walk-in happens. Um, at some, uh, the Americans tell the Pakistani senior generals that they're, they know about bin Laden, they want to come and get him. Do you have any evidence or information about the role and the attitude of the Saudis towards all this? Because bin Laden, is, uh, he, he may be under their control, but he's, he's also a figure of enormous, as you were saying. He's an icon that they're very careful about. Well, um, I can understand the leverage the U.S. government had with the Pakistanis vis-a-vis -vis the military support. The, 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 the whole Saudi position was uh, primarily to keep them away from us. That's all. And that's when there was a showdown in uh, Leon Panetta's office about it. I write about this. This is a section of the book. There was a showdown about what are you doing? Why, why did you tell us about it? And he says, hey, A, we're getting paid, and B, the Saudis had a reason. They didn't want you to, to talk to the guy. And the Pakistanis had a reason to keep him because as long as they had him, they had the Taliban in both countries, Pakistan and Afghanistan, and the Sunni, Sunni crazies, the Sunni fundamentalists, uh, talking to them because they, would t they told them right away, we got your guy. They told, there were a num number of people knew about this that did talk. This is not a shock. You know, you're talking, to, you know, talking among your, your fellow tribesmen and talking to us is, another, is a big difference. Because I said you, you, you have set off two bombs, but it's really three bombs because there's a bomb under the Saudis too. How about the bomb under me? There's a bomb under me too. So there's four bombs. I think bombs. there's no doubt about that. <laughs> yeah, I don't like all. I don't like all this. Some, I was accused of plagiarism in 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 some in, in a magazine. Well, I was saying the only way they can go after you, uh, go after your piece, is to go after you. Yeah, but I've done that before. Been there. That's not going to last long. Um, but the, the only problem they have is if they start getting into the definitive denials and see the CIA can probably get away with telling an untruth on grounds they're protecting the source. The walk-in, but that's that's they haven't done that yet. They've actually the administration has been very clever. They just attacking me, and they haven't they haven't really gone after any facts in the story. 
But yeah. that's going to change. But they also can't really tr go after your source, one would think, because if they ever wanted to find, try to figure out who your source is and charge them, they validate the story. NC. No comment. Thanks for joining us. Sure. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.